Hey there guys, it's Mr. Herbst here, and today our focus is going to be on Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection. Uh, Charles Darwin was this guy, he lived in the 1800s, and towards the uh, latter portion of his life, he grew a real big beard, and uh, because of that beard, he kind of looks pretty prominent in, in photographs, pretty recognizable. Um, he was British, and he was a naturalist, which means he liked to study nature. He sort of wanted to know, how do creatures change over time? So it's pretty obvious that uh, certainly there's some differences between what creatures look like in, uh, when the dinosaurs were around, for example, and what they look like today. So he kind of wanted to know, how does that all happen? So he developed his little theory of natural selection, which has grown to become one of the most accepted theories in all of science. On his little voyage, which we'll talk about in a second, he'll, he collected a lot of evidence to support his theory. So to start out here, he, he, he went on a voyage on a, a ship called the HMS Beagle, and he traveled around the world. His voyage took about six years, from 1831 to 1836. And if you do the math, he started his voyage when he was just 22 years old. Pretty remarkable. And on his voyage, he made lots and lots of observations. So a little bit more about Charles Darwin's voyage. Um, he spent a lot of time in the Galapagos Islands, and we'll talk about why in a minute. But if we go ahead and look down here at this map, he started here in, in Britain. He left from Britain and went all the way kind of around the coast of South America, and then he stopped when he got to the Galapagos Islands for a pretty long time. Over there, he, he found some very bizarre things. And he carried on uh, with his voyage all the way over here to New Zealand, where he saw some uh, more bizarre things. Australia, again, some more bizarre things. And then kind of around the... the uh, the horn here of Africa, and then up back to his home in the British Islands. So a little bit of information about the Galapagos Islands. They are volcanic islands, and they are off of the coast of Ecuador. So if we go, go ahead and look over here, here's the Galapagos Islands, and here's Ecuador. There's roughly about 500 miles separating that, separating that distance right there. But the Galapagos Islands are home to uh, an area where we have species of animals and plants that exist nowhere else on Earth. So there's some species that are very unique to just those specific islands. And so while Darwin was there, he sort of kind of made some observation and asked many questions, like why are those animals and plants only found in the Galapagos Islands? So here's a few examples of some of the unique species that, Ch that Charles Darwin found. Uh, one of them was the giant tortoise. These, these tortoises are absolutely humongous. Um, they're roughly about three feet tall, to put it in perspective. They are huge. And uh, he found some bizarre lizards and, and reptiles and some birds. More specifically, he found this species of bird called the finches, um, where they all had kind of different sized beaks. And we'll focus on that in a little bit. So when he was there, kind of looking at all these different animals, he began to ask, why are these, are these creatures really only found on the Galapagos Islands? And he found some clues within fossils. If we take a look at a modern-day armadillo, armadillos are kind of uh, uh, cute creatures. They roll up into little balls when they get scared. They're uh, kind of like roly-poly bugs, except that they are mammals. Um, and we find that wherever there are present-day modern living armadillos, there are fossils of armadillos, or at least creatures that resemble armadillos, kind of like this. Very, very similar-looking creatures within the fossil record. And it sort of made him ask, why are there extinct armadillos in the same area that we find modern armadillos? More specifically, why is all that found on the same continent? While he was out there, he also found some evidence of differences within living organisms themselves. Um, he took a look and he found that there were different sized shells of tortoises on different islands. So to put that in a different way, he found that there were some different species of tortoises that were specific to only certain islands. So even that there may only be a couple of miles so, so, uh, separating this island of Pinta from Isabella, um, they are some very distinct tortoises that live on each one of those islands. And he began to ask kind of why does that happen? And he kind of asked himself, is there a relationship between the environment or Another way of putting it, 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 is it possible that the environment 
that these different tortoises grew up on is causing them to look different. And there is no other example better than uh, the, uh, the finches that he found. There are currently 14 different species of finches found on the Galapagos Islands. But, and this is really kind of weird to think about, there's only one species of finch that we find on the mainland South America. Charles Darwin began to kind of think, well, if there's so many different finches found on the Galapagos Islands, but only one type of finch found on the mainland, maybe there is a relationship between the finches and the size of their beaks and the size of their, their overall body and the types of foods that they eat. So he began to kind of think, well, maybe it would be possible that the finches went from South America, mainland South America. Some of them flew over to the Galapagos Islands, and then from there, there was competition for food, and maybe they kind of looked a little bit different. And we'll talk about kind of how that all works in a little bit. But if we take a look at um, these species of finches that we currently find on the Galapagos Islands, right off the bat, you can kind of look that all of them have kind of different sized beaks. And Tar Darwin began to look uh, closely, and he found that those beaks are related to the types of foods that they eat. So, for example, if we take a, uh, an example, if we take, for example, this uh, finch right here, that finch has huge chompers. What kind of foods do you think would be uh, would that that uh, finch eat with those big chompers? Well, it says right down here that 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 finch is a seed eater, and if you kind of think about why. He's going to need a lot of force and the ability to break up tough seeds with his beak. Now, to kind of put it in perspective, imagine a walnut. Try cracking open a walnut with just your bare hands or your teeth. You probably, chances are, cannot do it. You have to use a tool to break open that, that walnut, um, which is going to allow for you to have a lot of leverage and a lot of power so you can crack it open. Well, that's kind of what that, uh, that beak is does. It allows for a lot of leverage to crack open that nut inside. And so based on what Charles Darwin found, he drew a few conclusions. He saw that there is certainly a struggle for existence. That means that members of the same species are competing for certain resources, such as those resources can be living space, they can be the access to mates, or simply just food. And so he found that there is a competition among animals. And you can certainly find plenty of examples of competition, even in your own backyard. And he sort of uh, saw that there are some adaptations and there is fitness. So for example, some species or some, some, um, or some individuals of that species are more fit to a certain environment. To put it in another way, some of those uh, some of those different individuals of a species, some of those birds, for example, it was easier for them to survive. Thus, they are more fit. And so they had certain adaptations, and an adaptation is anything that increases an organism's chance of survival. So those individual finches had the certain adaptations which allowed them to make it easier for them to survive. So because they survived, they had a higher chance of reproducing. And because they reproduced, the next generation of organisms is going to be more likely to resemble or look like those individuals that survived. Thus is born the theory of natural selection. So Charles Darwin noticed that individuals that are best suited to their environment, they survive and reproduce most successfully. And because they reproduce, they pass along the genes for those uh, those capabilities of surviving easier. And this idea is also known as survivor of the fittest. You may have heard of that little phrase before. Charles Darwin kind of coined that phrase. Basically, the ones that are more fit are more likely to survive. And he sort of came up with this idea of descent with modification, where those small changes in species from parents to offspring those small changes where the, the easier ones, the ones that could survive easier, would then pass along their genes and look more similar to the ones that survived, and you repeat that cycle over and over, those small changes would eventually build up to make big changes. And so eventually, after many, many generations of going through um, this natural selection, eventually it may be that the population of the ones that have been surviving for so long 
won't even look like the ones that the original population that they came from. And so eventually it's possible that it led to whole new species. That's descent with modification. No other example of descent with modification is more prominent than within those 14 species of finches, where all of them started from an original finch, but those they all kind of descended to look different. And now we find 14 different species of finches from that one original finch. And again, it was all probably based on the competition for resources. All right, so to sum up, basically, we have some variation within organisms. That basically is saying that not all the organisms look the same. You go through natural selection and the ones that are best suited or for their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. So thus over several generations it's going to be the ones that are better equipped to survive are going to go ahead and be the ones to reproduce. Now there was one thing that Darwin couldn't really conclude. Darwin looked at macroscopic things. He looked at phenotypes. He looked at things that he could see. But he, could, he didn't really understand, and, and remember, this was in the 1800s, he didn't understand how traits are passed down from parents to offspring. But guess what? You guys know it's in the DNA of organisms. So within the genes, within the DNA of organisms is a code for those phenotypes or what people and organisms look like. And so those things are passed down from parents to offspring. Anyway guys, that concludes our introduction to Charles Darwin and natural selection. Make sure you complete the Google form below. This is Mr. Herbst. I'm signing off folks. You all have a nice day.